those who have persevered. And then she said, uh, in her own words, she said it was dim as dusk. Below us were, were people dressed in clothes and dreary and no other colors in comparison to the other worlds we'd seen. These people were content because they knew that they would go to heaven someday, but there was suffering. They were still suffering, especially because of how death we glimpse, we go into that light, and then when we go to where we need to go, if we need purification, we're separated from that light for a period of time, and that is the great suffering, separation from God, when you've seen his light, when you've been in his light, when you have felt his light. He said the last place we visited was a land of twilight where the only illumination was an unpleasant shade of red that reminded me of congealed blood. The heat that rose from this world was stifling. It brushed my face like a flame. I feared that my skin would blister and crack. I couldn't look at the countless people who populated that unhappy place because their misery and anguish pained me so greatly. Mary didn't have to say the name of this place. I knew it was hell. She described that as a place of despair where the road leading away from God's life ends. So the, the, the last one, by the way, she had her experience in 1983 for more than 40 hours, starting on Good Friday and ending on Easter Sunday. She was out to such an extent that even when they brought in medical personnel with desoscopes and so forth, they could detect absolutely no sign of life. And like some of these experiences that I mentioned, she exhibited that stiffening rigor mortis and the bishop said, I know what we've been told, but she's obviously dead. We need to prepare for her funeral. And then uh, she came back after, and, and she described the spark of the place so of this tremendous, once again, of tremendous, tremendous beauty. All these places, you know, I mean, it, it's, uh, it gets intense, and sometimes when we think of these things, we long for them. But we know that even, even those who had this experience, they, they no longer fear death and look forward to dying. Even though they look forward to dying, they aren't in a hurry to do it because while what they have seen is something they want to get back to so badly that they never wanted to come back here to earth no matter what at the same time they now realize they realize they were shown they were told during their experience that they have a mission in life and they finally understood it just like we'll understand it because each person here on earth, each person here in this convocation hall, every person you've ever known and ever will, has a mission in life, has an equal mission in life. Everybody is equal in the eyes of God. Everybody is made equally. Everybody, it, it, you may not be able to understand it until you are on the other side, because what you're doing here may seem to you trivial, or what other people are doing may seem trivial to you. There is no such thing as a trivial mission. All, there are various, there are great souls at all stations of life. At all stations of life. There are great people, maybe, who are leaders, and maybe there are great there are people who are leaders who aren't great people. And then there are there are people who are janitors or uh, who are cleaning the room I slept in an hotel last night, and they seem by worldly standards to be trivial and unimportant, but somehow what they're doing has eternal effects, has a ripple effect. We won't understand it until we die and we go through what they call a life review where our entire lives will be shown to us in every detail, at every moment, like I said, because there is no moment on earth that is wasted by God. Every moment of life will be shown to us and we'll not only see it, but we'll re-experience it 
and will not only re experience it as we did, but as everyone around us did also. That's why there is nothing I can tell you today that is more important than this. And this is the most consistent thing that I hear in all of these near-death experiences. The first thing God wanted to know was how much they had loved. How much they had loved. When we love, no matter what we're doing for a living, when we love, we are sending forth light into his creation, and when we die, we will see it. We'll see that some clerk at, at, at a convenience store who smiles, at the grocery store, who smiles at everyone and makes them feel better, may, may have really earned a high place in heaven because of that smile, because of using her gift. Whatever your gift is, it may not be smiling at everyone, but using your gift, what God gave you to complete your mission of love on earth. You know, I'm a man, it's not easy to talk about love. I never would have when I was a journalist. Sounds mushy and all that, but that's the one major thing. If you don't re recall afterwards anything I have said today, please remember that there is absolutely nothing more important. Nothing. And that is what brings light here and in the Is it difficult? <laughs> of course it is. Again, I could bring up driving around in a busy city, and especially on a, on a and we bear the rush out. But we are, because when we die, if we still have anger or impatience or resentment, unforgiveness, if we still have anxieties and so forth, these are things that need to be cleansed, and we will have to cleanse them in, in, in you know, purgatorial state. And there are many levels of purgatory also before we get to that place for heart before we head on our way to I see God. Every day this is that opportunity. And of course you gotta watch out and pray for patience and suddenly you're giving a lot of opportunities to exercise patience and force to be there. But that's what we need to do. You know, besides, uh, just to, before we go on quickly, and I have to move quickly because we have limited time. Um, before I go on, I mentioned that you see everybody you knew and loved on the other side. And in some cases, these people will say that they not only encountered deceased loved ones, but they encountered thousands and thousands of people who welcomed them very strongly and cheered for them when they arrived and embraced them and sent them so much love surrounding them. And, they, and at first they couldn't figure out who these people were who seemed to know them so well. And then they find out that they were ancestry, ancestors back to the beginning of human time. One of the missions in life I submit for your consideration may be family, maybe cleansing the family line, maybe making sure that whatever perhaps was passed on to you spiritually, whatever darkness may have been in, in the past of your ancestry, is not passed on to the next generation and generations after that. The mission is difficult to cleanse the darknesses in our family. But we are cheered on after we move and we come uh, in the second part of this morning we'll be talking a little bit more about spiritual warfare and about cleansing the family tree. <coughs> then there's I mentioned purgatory. And again there's to repeat, there's many levels of purgatory. These counts not just from your death experiences, but from Catholic mystics to the ages. And we go where we need to go. We, there, there, it may be that middle purgatory where it seems most people are, that it's kind of foggy, like a gray day, and lonely, not really that sweet suffering, but 
the loneliness and the suffering. It may be a lower place than that that's closer to hell that starts to resemble hell, except that the devil is not present. It may even be painful like ice cold or, or, or hot at the other extreme. And then there are, there's the top level of purgatory, one, according to one very, very valuable mystical revelation. I think we may have it at our book table called Unpublished Manuscript on Purgatory. And if it's not there, I've got it in a, a couple of my books on the afterlife. Uh, as, I, as I mentioned, what you take to heaven and the other side. Um, but there's also, in, in these accounts, that produce these, uh, these renditions of how suddenly everything coalesces. <coughs> well, you know, there's how, how there is a purgatory and how the top level is very much like heaven. This, this one revelation of how this manuscript of purgatory even mentions, uh, calls it the threshold, because it's, right, it's kind of like the waiting room for heaven right before you go into heaven, according to her revelation, which is approved by the church. <laughs> I, I try to stay mainly with such revelations. I'll tell you, this, this afternoon when we're discussing apparitions, I'll tell you once, I'll refer to once when they're approved or not approved. And then there's hell. And hell is very, very real. I've heard these descriptions even from perhaps many of you have heard. I'll take a little quick survey. How many have heard the account from Dr. Howard Storm here? Not too many. Let me just quickly write it down in a minute. But before I do, I'd like to mention one other thing about low theory books. Or the ladies class, the top part of it. I guess there is no top part of all. This one fellow named Alan, he had a near death experience. A nurse sends her. She de details the whole thing on her. She just details that. Right? And he described being taken, being shown where he could go if he died for good at that moment. And he said he was like taken down this mountain, and it was all these dark mountains around. And he was being taken by St. Michael, the Archangel, and they were going down, down, down on a narrow path with these deep, deep, endless valleys. And he said that demons, evil spirits, would try to jump out and grab him. Of course, he had St. Michael with him. And St. Michael showed him various levels of hell. He showed, he opened this gigantic bowl, and he said he just showed him this incredible suffering in there. He saw countless cubes, he called them, like cells, one after another stacked up and going on for endless miles, each one small and having a person in it who was constantly reliving, watching the things in their lives that had gotten into this horrible place, this horrible state, as demons haunt them. A very pleasant, a very pleasant situation. But consistent, I heard a guy named Melvin, uh, uh, named, uh, named Melvin uh, Dullin, I think his name was, back in Arizona, New Mexico. I don't have a memory of this too, but it, he, he described the same thing, seeing all these cubes. St. Teresa of Avila described being taken to hell to see what it was like and seeing all the cool cages the souls had to be confined in this dark area that seemed muddy. Well, this guy, Alan, he, he went down even further. He said he wouldn't take it to the worst part of hell. He went down further in those cubes and he saw this place where this awful entity I don't know if it was Satan or a demon or whatever, this awful horned creature was on this throne, this tarnished, filthy throne, uh, sitting atop a pile of tarnished gold coins and money, indicating that that can get us up in a lot of trouble, materials. Mm -hmm. People, when you come back on the other side, they'll tell you to be extremely, extremely cautious 
about flowing after money and focusing on it. And if you look at our time, the materialism is, is outrageous and extremely, extremely dangerous. It's one of the reasons she appeared at the mayor and wanted, she said, because it was one of the last pure places on earth, and the reason it's one of the last pure places is because the people there live in what we see as abject poverty, but spiritually, they're, they're not impoverished at all. They look upon us as impoverished. They are perfect. They, they may only own the shirt they have on that was donated by a missionary, a shirt they wear every day for six months to a year, many men and many. Sometimes taken with blood, walking barefoot, sleeping on during the night the children do, I met them. And yet, happy and knowing that there is a God, there is a heaven. And the Virgin Mary visited the Bayo, and you'll see these kids, they may not own a single thing. If I gave them this pen right here, and I gave them some little things when I was there, they act like you give them a million dollars, a little piece of candy. They have nothing. But they do have little jugs, they have jugs, old plastic jugs, that they keep filled with holy water. After the Virgin Mary appeared there, because when she appeared at the Bayo, when, it, when the seniors were going into apparition, they would, of course, first, they'd see all the people gathered there just before the apparition, and they would look like we all look today. And then as soon as the Virgin came, everyone seemed to change and turn into like a flower, a different flower. Some were radiant, some were beautiful, others less so, duller, others outright wilted, reflecting the stakes of their souls, just like that robe will. And they were told to, by the Virgin Mary, to sprinkle holy water. This is why the kids carry each other. To sprinkle holy water on uh, everyone. And when they did, they would see these wilted flowers suddenly spring to full life. The daughter ones being radiant. You may have read the story before I get into this. Dr. Howard Storm and then we'll take a break. You may have heard the Tony Gloria, Dr. Gloria Polo, who was a dentist and was literally struck by lightning in Columbia. It was in Bogota. Uh, and she was extremely materialistic, extremely sensual, extremely into her body, extremely lustful and, and immoral by her own description. She had paid for some young people she knew to have abortions. And her birth control. Thought she was doing a good deed. And she said it was very interesting because she described, she said she was from herself and she was struck by lightning in this place that had all these dark, it was like underground, and these dark tunnels similar to what St. Jesus of uh, Evola saw, but she said they seemed just endless and confusing, and she said so dark that so, so gloomy that they would make the, the darkest corner on earth seem like daylight in comparison, seem like the sun at noonday. She also said she was very interesting because at one point when Jesus was reviewing her life with her, she saw everything, of course, and at one point she saw herself sitting before the television in her living room, and she was watching the news, and on the news that night was this woman who was weeping because her husband had been assassinated by thugs hired uh, by her landlord. He was trying to get them out of the apartment to live in with her family, and because he wanted, I guess, higher rent, and they refused to leave, and so he had the hus her husband murdered. She was weeping, she had no place to stay, and Gloria Bola just said something like, oh, well, we're here, and turned to her exercise show, to her fitness program. She was really into, into the way she looked. And Jesus showed her that if, instead of doing that, she had gone on her knees and said a prayer for that poor woman, that everything would have been different. For instance, he showed her that later in her, later on, Dr. Polo was with her son. 
and they were driving through Bogota in, in a red light district, this, the sleazy part of town. And her son said, oh, mommy, what's that woman doing over there pointing at a prostitute, street woman? Why is she dressed that way? And Dr. Cole said, don't even look at that awful woman. She's disgusting. Don't pay any attention to her. She's awful. She was shown by Jesus during her near death experience that that woman was the same woman she had seen on TV crying when her husband was killed. She was now a prostitute because she was trying to support, trying to feed her family. And she was shown that had she gone down on her knees instead of just flipping the channels, the Holy Spirit would have inspired her to contact the woman and put her in touch with a priest she knew who happened to live in that area. Dr. Paul knew a priest who lived in that area from her, her youth. And if she had put them in contact, the one of the priests would have taken care of that woman and she would not have become a prostitute. Very interesting because when we die, we're now been shown what we've done but what we haven't done. And we're also not just showing what actions in our lives, but every word and every thought is a little gone from this moment. Which is why we need to purify every single thought we have and try to imbue every thought, every thought for sure, every thought with love. It purifies, love purifies, love protects. What protects us on earth from the evil one brings us to heaven afterwards. That bubble of protection comes from love. That bubble of protection comes from humility. That bubble of protection comes from not being worldly. Getting away from all of these remarkable temptations of earth. Dr. Howard Storm was an atheist, not just an atheist, he was a militant atheist. He was from Northern Kentucky. His wife was a very, he was a professor at North, of Northern Ohio University in charge. He was the head of the art department there. His wife was a very, very prominent attorney. This is kind of the Cincinnati area, Kentucky and Ohio border here. And they were going over, they were in Paris with a group of students taking a tour of museums and art museums. I guess that's their version of a pilgrimage. And one, one of the mornings, in a, in, down in a hotel room, getting ready for the day, all of a sudden, Dr. Storm felt an incredible pain in his abdomen, below his rib cage, and he just doubled over and collapsed to the floor and rushed him to the hospital, where they quickly diagnosed him as having a rupture to you know, that part of the digestive system after the stomach. And they told him that he needed surgery or he would die because his digestive juices were leaking and attacking the rest of his body. This is a guy who wasn't just an atheist, he was a militant atheist. He used to make fun of the Baptist secretary in his department. He, he once had a gun take his course and he enjoyed talking to her about art, but he told her, Sister, if you were happy to class, if you talk about God in my classroom, I have to ask you to leave. He was a militant atheist. But anyway, now he's facing death. And he told us that just the juices uh, were leaking out. And there were, but the only problem was there was not a surgeon available, so they brought him to this room. There was another guy waiting to in another bed. But uh, Dr. Storm and his wife are waiting there. She's sitting by his bedside. He's laying there. It's getting worse by the minute, more painful by the minute. And one minute turns into one hour, and one excruciating hour turns into two, and so forth, until they're approaching nine hours of waiting, and as he is now approaching the end. He knew he couldn't take it another moment, and he knew he was going to die. He was absolutely certain that when he did, it was going to be lights out, fade to black. That's the end of Howard Storm. Existence, period. He turned his wife, they embraced, they cried, and then he turned to his other side to die, and he did. Except that instead of finding himself no longer in existence, 
I don't know how you can find this like that. But no more in existence and found himself looking at his body, disembodied like we read from the end, like I read from the end at the beginning of this session. Wondering, confused, how can I be here? My body's there. I feel better, but everything's different. My colors are different. I can see all the molecules of air in this room. I can see every thread in the carpet. Uh, there's the hallway over here, but it's not really a hallway now. It's like a foggy passageway. You can see his wife, but they couldn't communicate. And he hears voices in the hallway saying, Come on, Howard, in English. Come on, Howard, come on, we've been waiting for you, come on. <laughs> a little nervous. They're speaking English in Paris. He decides to wander into the passageway. This point, he can't see them. Say, come on, Howard, we have to wait a long time. And he starts following their voices. And he said, it's like an eternity. They're going, following their voices and following their voices, and it's like they're going down and down. And they're becoming increasingly insistent. It's about an hour, they're going to have a full-on talk. Come on, hurry up. More and more insistent. And then pretty aggressive. Come on, hour, come on, get it going. Who knows what else? Pretty soon, just outright hostile and aggressive and vicious. He said they started to hurl curses at him like no curses you've ever heard on this earth. They said, that, they said stuff to him that he still, he has never repeated to his soul. It was so difficult. They're leading him down this passageway and he's going down. All of a sudden, they're coming out of the fog and he can see them. They look like they were once human but are now like half animal, half human. And just like classic visages of demons, they have these sharp eye custom teeth and pointed, pointedness about their features and their uh, nails. And they start clawing at his spiritual flesh, tearing it apart, attacking him saying things, like I said, that were just unbelievable. And he, he is now terrified. He knows that he's, as he puts it, he is on his way to the cesspool of the universe. He's in a sewer on his way to the cesspool of the universe. And he knew it was going to get a lot worse. He hears the voice say, call out to God, Howard, and he thinks, I don't believe in that. The voice comes another time, I don't believe in that. And then a third time, these things often come in trees. I've had it in my own life, but I'll discuss that this afternoon. And anyway, he uh, finally is so scared that he's trying to think of a prayer. Well, I'll get down pray how the praise being called. He can't think of anything, so he's, you know, he's over there in the States and he he can't think of anything with God in any except he starts saying stuff like the Pledge of Allegiance to the Flag, one nation under God. It's <laughs> funny, <laughs> <laughs> but in fact, he speaks away. He quieted these entities away, these evil entities. And he knew he had something going on now. So he's trying to think of, of anything further. And he had gone to Methodist school when he was young. Uh, Sunday school, and he remembered a, a, a song there, Jesus Loves Me, This I Know, and he started to sing it, and that backed him up again into the fog, and now he's, he knows that, that this means something, he calls out to Jesus to save him, and sees this incredible light coming, like a comet, he thought he was going to be annihilated, and lift him up out of this so-called sewer, but he was put in the presence of these angels, and showed his future,